So, Itamar, now the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, in, in, in past years, I've dealt several times in an effort to, to do forecasting. And we try to develop a methodology. Um, because there is a normal uh, tendency among experts and others to, s to simply assume that current trends will continue. But you know that uh, surprises happen when a trend breaks and there is a fundamental shift. The trick, of course, is to identify which trends will continue and which will stop uh, dramatically at, uh, at some point. So I'll, I'll try some of that towards the end of my initial comments. But I'd like to look at the dominant trends in the Middle East in the past few years and see whether they will continue or not. So what do we have? We have, in a way, the post-Arab Spring, something that Ibtissam referred to in, in a different way. The underlying social and political unrest, economic aggravation that led to the outburst of the Arab Spring were defeated uh, in the middle of the previous century, but they did not disappear. They are still there. The unrest is still there. And uh, I assume that it will continue during the coming decade. It, it may burst out in this or that place, but it will continue. It will remain a defining uh, element of the Middle Eastern scene. Uh, second is the rise of the two regional superpowers, uh, or regional pow uh, major powers, Iran and Turkey. It was not the case decades ago. It has been the, the case with Iran, say, uh, beginning in 79, with Turkey beginning in the first decade of this century. But now, uh, these two uh, states, with a population of about 90 million, strong economies, strong armies, and a desire to revive a glorious imperial past, seeking hegemony or partial hegemony in the Middle East. And it's, it's been, of course, a major defining force. And I think it will, uh, it will continue. Uh, third, we have the uh, shift away, uh, pivoting away of the United States uh, from the region, which began dramatically with uh, Obama, continued in different ways uh, under Trump, and of course, just had a, a dramatic uh, <coughs> manifestation uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, I think it, it, it will continue. It, may, it might be moderated to some extent because the Middle East is not a, an area that you can just ignore. Even if the Asia-Pacific area uh, becomes uppermost on your mind, you cannot neglect the Middle East. As somebody once said, after 9-11, if you do not visit the Middle East, the Middle East will visit you. So I don't think the United States would be able to, to afford a, a complete uh, departure or exit. Uh, it will have to, uh, to find a way to, to live with a continuing presence uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East. The other pole of, of this development is the return of, of Russia. I think it was underplayed by Vitaly Naumkin earlier uh, today. I think their appearance uh, in, in Syria is a deciding element in enabling Bashar al-Assad to remain in power, of course, in partnership with Iran. The, the, the games they play in, in Libya and, uh, and elsewhere, they, they are here. And, of course, China. China, until now, has been interested in the Middle East more in economic and infrastructure terms. It has not sought military presence or di diplomatic might. I think what we may see uh, later in this decade is a, an assertion of, uh, uh, of China's growing influence. Finally, the, uh, the Arab-Israeli, or now I may say uh, Israeli-Palestinian issue. What has been happening is a telescopization of the Arab-Israeli conflict into uh, an Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, it, it, it is being uh, modulated. I think the Abraham Accords, what is happening among 20% of Israel's Arab population, the tendency to join Israeli society and politics. We now have, for the first time, an Israeli-Arab-Palestinian party in the government coalition. All this means that uh, the issue is there, and it, it, it could 
be exacerbated. There could be further escalations of, uh, uh, of violence, uh, primarily with, with Gaza. Perhaps if the Palestinian Authority collapses, another form of an intifada I absolutely cannot be, uh, uh, cannot be uh, ruled out. And the Arab-Israeli, what you used to call the Arab-Israeli conflict, has become hybrid. Say, more and more Arab states want to normalize, but the Palestinian issue is here to, to stay, and the region will have to find a way of, of living with this, uh, uh, this more complex uh, uh, reality. So, uh, wh where the trends, I think, could be, could be broken, uh, where there could be definitely the, uh, a collapse of one of the Arab listen regimes. Uh, there could be another round of Palestinian Israeli fighting and the, co the, the uh, competition, uh, the conflict between Israel and Iran over the nuclear issue and over what Iran is building in Syria could lead to another serious armed collision and that collision would not be limited to just one country. A war in the north on the northern front of Israel would include Lebanon and Syria and Iran. It's going to be a a massive event if it uh, uh, if it happens. So, not uh, not necessarily a very optimistic uh, outlook. But who in the Middle East can afford to be optimistic? Thank you very much. Um, it's interesting that with Ibtisam and well, Ibtisam, you refer to the post-oil era, and of course, the title of um, of this session is actually uh, not just on the geopolitics, but also the economics. And, of course, our neighbor here, Saudi Arabia, has famously got its Vision 230. And Dubai, of course, has this 10 times concept and so on. I mean, there is, I think, a desire throughout the Arab world to try to think of, uh, of an economic future which, goes, which is somehow separate from all the political pressures which seem to be ever-present and probably ever-permanent. Mm -hmm.